Well, hello there and uh, now we will be discussing another module and we will be discussing about dyspnea in palliative care and I am Dr. Abhijit Dham and I am the president of the National Association of Palliative Care for Ayush and Integrative Medicine. Well, dyspnea, let me assure you friends, is one of the most devastating symptoms that can happen in palliative care and it is terrible. Believe me, those of you who are listening to me and are asthmatics or are suffering from COPD would definitely agree with me that how aggravating or how terrible a symptom dyspnea can be. Dyspnea is uh, or breathlessness as, as we also call it. It is a subjective experience. Now, this is very important that it is a subjective experience that this is my own experience that is the patient's own experience. It is just like pain. It is a very personal and it is a subjective experience. Now, suppose there is a gentleman who is sitting quietly and uh, he says that I am having trouble in breathing. So, you might not want to believe him because he is sitting quietly otherwise. But as I said, just like pain, breathlessness or dyspnea is also a subjective experience. That is, it is if the patient says that I am feeling dyspneic, that is it. That means, he is dyspneic and you have no business to challenge his views on that because that is his subjective feeling, right. So, a subjective experience of breathing discomfort that consists of qualitatively distinct sensations that vary in intensity. The experience results from interaction among multiple physiological, psychological, social and environmental factors and may induce secondary physiologic and behavioral responses which means that your dyspnea can be precipitated by a number of events, be it an infection, be it trauma, be it pain or be it from bad news, hearing bad news. So, psychological factors are very important in either precipitating or aggravating dyspnea. So, uh, this uh, diagram just uh, briefly we will go through it. It gives us the physiology of normal breathing. This is our chest wall, our lungs chest wall. So, the moment we take a deep breathe. So, there are stretch receptors in the lungs and in the thoracic wall which expand and these impulses are traveling up to the brain to the medulla through the uh, respiratory center in one part of the brain and the brain says uh, now says that yeah you have you have taken in a good breath now now it is the time to stop taking that breath and then gradually you stop taking the breath and then expiration that is the gases now are expired out which is a more of uh, more or less a passive phenomenon and then to modulate these there are other chemo receptors like which monitor the level of oxygen and carbon dioxide and the pH of your blood also. So, it is a very sophisticated mechanism which basically guides us how we breathe and how frequently should we breathe, right. So, disturbances in these in this system because you see this system uh, has so many components right from the chest wall to the brain and the brain has in inputs from so many sources like the ears. So, if you hear bad news, you can have dyspnea. If you see a sight which is bad, you can have dyspnea. If you inhale some pungent things, you can have dyspnea, right. So, so there could be so many problems. If your uh, oxygen level in your blood goes down, you will have dyspnea. Remember, uh, after run, running a, uh, for a kilometer, uh, you will have trouble in breathing for some time. But then, now there is a difference. Now, suppose you run for a kilometer and then you have a difficulty in breathing, but that is not very uncomfortable. Why? Because you know that because I have run for a kilometer, I am having a trouble in breathing. So, that is fine that is that the brain acknowledges as normal, but if you suddenly start having difficulty in breathing without any apparent reason or for which you have no explanation, your brain does not have an explanation for that is perceived as dyspnea, right. So, dyspnea is an abnormal sensation basically. It is an abnormal sensation which results from an abnormal awareness of the sense of breathing. Suppose you focus on your breathing, 
yeah, I am taking a, taking in a breath. Now I am leaving it out, and you constantly, if you focus on your breathing for some time, then that breathing becomes difficult. You have a sense of difficulty. You are more aware of your breathing, so that that uncomfortable awareness of your breathing is called dyspnea, right? So uh, dyspnea can occur in up to 50 percent of the hospice patients. So, 50 percent of the terminally ill can actually have dyspnea and this incidence can actually go up as death approaches. So, as I said dyspnea is an uncomfortable awareness of breathing, it has nothing to do with the respiratory rate. You might be having a normal respiratory rate of say 14 to 16 per minute and still be having dyspnea and a person who would be having a respiratory rate of 35 per minute may not be having dyspnea, because that person who has just come after running for a kilometer, he would be having a respiratory rate of 35, but he is not dyspneic, because he understands that because I have run for a kilometer, now I am having trouble in breathing. So, that is normal for him, but an uncomfortable awareness of breathing, which is not which the brain perceives as abnormal is what is dyspnea and dyspnea is a subjective sensation. So, it is more of a subjective symptom, patients may feel dyspneic without signs of respiratory distress or vice versa. So, exact mechanism is not known because as I said there are so many inputs, so it is a multifactorial thing and it is the most common severe symptom in the last days of life, because it not only affects the patient, but it also affects the caregivers. For the caregivers watching their loved ones having difficulty in breathing is so very devastating. Right? So, this is one of the symptoms which needs to be managed very thoughtfully and with a lot of compassion and patience you need to be there for the patient. right? So, now this uh, particular study uh, shows that as death approaches, as death as a patient approaches death, the incidence of dyspnea goes on increasing. So, 42 days before death, the incidence was almost 50 percent, which increased to almost 65 percent 7 days before dying. So, as a person approaches death, the incidence of dyspnea also keeps on increasing. Now, look at this gentleman and you can easily find out that he is dyspneic. See his mouth is slightly open, right? his accessory muscles, see these muscles are standing out, very prominent muscles. He has a very anxious look about him. His eyebrows see the forehead muscles are also wrinkled and he is sitting up straight like this. So, this is a classic example of how a person with dyspnea looks like. So, as I said it is a subjective experience of breathing discomfort and it should not be confused with tachypnea. Tachypnea means an increased rate of respiration tachypnea would not necessarily mean that the patient is dyspneic and it can be distressing for the patients and caregivers that is very important. So, anxiety see there is a vicious cycle shortness of breath can result in shallow breathing, tense muscles and you get anxious and things start getting worse and worse. So, this cycle has to be broken somewhere and the best place to break it is this place, anxiety, you can take away the anxiety. So, coming to the causes of dyspnea, there could be so many causes of dyspnea like tumor and in infection, anemia, congestive heart failure, superior vena cava obstruction, so on and so forth. But what matters is how you tackle dyspnea, because as I said, it is just like pain as I said it is a subjective phenomenon and it needs to be tackled at an individual level and also you have to take care of the family members, the expectations of the family members is also very important out there, because a tense family member standing by the side of a dyspneic patient would only aggravate the 
patient's dyspnea. So, uh, the goal is rapid subjective improvement. So, you have to assess the intensity. How to assess the in intensity? Simply use the visual analog scale from 0 to 10. 0 is no dyspnea, 10 is the worst uh, possible dyspnea. Ask the patient in the scale where does he stand, right. So, because it is a subjective symptom and then there are so many drugs like corticosteroids, frusamides, antibiotics depending on the etiology of, of the dyspnea. So, let us not go into that because this would be so varied depending on the etiology, but what you can do and what anybody can do. See this was another patient causing having dyspnea. You can see his huge malignant tumor, this is the, he had a malignancy of the thyroid which was actually compressing the airway. It was compressing the trachea and thus causing dyspnea. So, this was a demonstrable cause of dyspnea. So, what is most important is this step 3 out here, which is non specific symptomatic management. It is something like chronic pain management, where you just do not just blindly jump into drugs and oxygen and this and that. Focus on whatever resources you have, and let me assure you, you have plenty of resources, even your bare hands have fantastic resources, right. So, calm reassurance to the patient calm him down, he is so anxious, just calm him, tell him that do not worry, I am here for you, I will not leave you, I am here by your side, hold his hand, gently pat his back, because patting between the shoulder blades reduces the tension, you, whenever you are anxious, the shoulder muscles, they usually tend to go into spasm. So, gently be, uh, make things uh, quite relaxed for the patient. You can put the patient in a position of his choice. Many would like to sit up, many would like to remain uh, lying down comfortably. Open a window, switch on the fan, because the sense of uh, that claustrophobic sense should be dissipated, right. So, there should be direct air blowing to the face of the patient. So, that is very relaxing. Now, as far as oxygen is concerned, please give oxygen only if it is indicated. That is only if there is documented hypoxia, that means if the saturation level is below 88 or 90 percent, only then you give oxygen. Otherwise, routinely do not give oxygen. If oxygen is not required, please do not start it, because once you start a life sustaining therapy, then it becomes very difficult to stop it. So, only give things which are required. Now, opioids, low dose morphine actually is, is got a beautiful effect in tackling dyspnea, right. The exact mechanism is unknown, but low dose uh, opioids uh, by a central mechanism, they help in reducing dyspnea. And there are other drugs uh, which are still quite uh, controversial, uh, but then opioids, morphine especially. Uh, really does have a very good effect in reducing the intensity of dyspnea. See here uh, another lady with dyspnea, she has COPD and uh, quite dyspneic. So, the patient's assessment of their dyspnea is the most reliable, take a good history. Clinical signs do not always correlate with the symptom experience, because this, this is a subjective phenomenon. It is the patient's own perception and feeling right. Do not use oxygen saturation as a sole measure of dyspnea. Just because the saturation is say 88 percent does not mean that the patient is dyspneic. The patient would be quite comfortable with a saturation of 88 percent for a say a patient with COPD of long standing. He would be happy with uh, you know mild to moderate degree of hypoxia. So, this was another patient of mine, uh, he had malignant melanoma and multiple metastasis in the lungs and uh, this boy is his son. He is standing beside his father and gently rubbing the back of his father and that that is the palliation, that is the palliation of dyspnea, right. Reducing anxiety to have somebody standing by your side, so that you're, you do not feel lonely and neglected no, that helps to reduce to that helps to break that anxiety cycle and the cycle of dyspnea 
self propagating cycle of dyspnea is broken. As I said oxygen therapy do not be in a hurry to start oxygen therapy although it is it is become a social uh, therapy nowadays because the relatives would say that oh you have not even given oxygen sir. So, make them understand that oxygen would only be indicated if there is documented hypoxia and if the hypoxia is responsible for the dyspnea because oxygen is not always going to help right. So, there are um, multiple uh, effects of multiple adverse effects the cons of giving oxygen therapy the most important is like if the patient is having a mask oxygen mask it's, it becomes so difficult to communicate with them properly it acts as a barrier to good communication you know and of course there are uh, there is the cost factor financial factors and availability of oxygen on a regular basis uh, after the second and third uh, wave of uh, covid you all know how difficult it was to get oxygen right on a regular basis so, opioids as I said uh, systemic opioids reduce subjective sensation by an uncertain mechanism and comfort achieved before respiratory compromise. So, one would also be sort of uh, afraid that if I give morphine maybe the respiratory drive will go down and maybe the patient will stop breathing or so these are unsubstantiated right these are unsubstantiated concerns. So, opioids in opioid naive patients you start with a very low dose like 2.5 milligram orally uh, PRN and uh, that way maybe uh, you can gradually build up on the doses. Now, concerns about double effect now what exactly is this double effect double effect basically means that you are going you are giving a drug for beneficence of the patient that is for helping the patient alleviate symptoms of the patient but the side effects of the drug might have an untoward effect and may result in harm. So, this is double effect for example, like in morphine uh, you might be concerned that morphine might cause respiratory depression in a breathless patient or something which is not exactly substantiated, but even if we theoretically take it to be true. Uh, then that would be an example of a double effect that is you are why are you giving morphine you are giving morphine because you want the patient to have a degree of relief, but an untoward or an undesirable side effect of morphine is it can cause respiratory depression in high doses, but here we are giving low doses right. So, this can constitute a double effect sort of situation. And as I said the psychological support in breathlessness is very important uh, exploration for of concerns what are your concerns talk to the patient talk to the family members give explanations to the best of your ability do not leave the patient alone right always have somebody stand by the patient stand behind and gently gently stroke the shoulders of the patient ask the patient to focus on how to breathe out mostly patients are during dyspnea they are mostly focused on breathing in how to breathe in ask the patient to silently count 1, 2, 3 and then gently breathe out. So, if you increase the duration of expiration automatically the respiratory rate would come down and prepare for the next attack with reassurance. So, this was another patient uh, in our critical care unit COPD again and you can see the nurse standing behind the patient and gently you know uh, holding the patient not leaving the patient alone gently stroking the back, back of the patient and most important see the patient is without any oxygen support right. Although he is dyspneic he is without any oxygen support because he does not need it. There are certain complementary therapies which can actually help like yoga, reiki, meditation, biofeedback, distraction breathing retraining exercises like I told you focus focusing on how to breathe out instead of focusing on how to breathe in. So, as you breathe out you count silently 1, 2, 3 and breathe out that way. So, increase the duration of expiration. So, this is one of the photographs taken from Tata Memorial uh, Hospital Mumbai where they have regular yoga 
sessions for the um, uh, for the cancer patients. And in special situations like you have respiratory panic attacks and all that you can give benzodiazepine sublingually like lorazepam 0.5 milligram uh, and so on and so forth. So, for respiratory panic attacks what you need to do is stay calm that is very important try to stay calm purse your lips. So, that you th this is to generate an auto peep an auto positive end expiratory pressure while so that you purse your leap, lips while breathing out relax forcibly relax your shoulders your back neck arms just stay relaxed and focus on breathing out rather than breathing in and that's the end of this module friends and i hope uh, that uh, it's been an interesting session for you thank you